Well, we've done it. We've finally done it. We've made it to episode 150. And by some miracle of a coincidence, this just so happens to be roughly around my five-year anniversary. I started reviewing animation on February 22nd of 2013. Now, technically, Animated Atrocities didn't start until around August, but I've never really considered that specifically my debut. And I, I just want to let this sink in for a moment or two, because I feel that I've actually impressed myself and accomplished something, or overcame something, if you will. Before I started this YouTube channel, you might have a hard time believing this, but I was really shy. I didn't talk to anyone, I kept my personal life hidden away from even the people who were closest to me. Not only that, but I had a problem sticking with things. I've said this before, but I often felt like Professor Calamitous from Jimmy Neutron, because it always felt like I just couldn't finish anything. It wasn't so much that I would lose interest, but I'd often hit a roadblock that I couldn't cross. Whether it was an ability that I couldn't seem to learn or life just getting in the way. But here we are with these little reviews. Episode 150, something that I've actually been doing for five years, which is an accomplishment to say the least. And I want to say that I'm really grateful that you guys have been sticking with me for so long on this journey, especially with so many ups and downs over the years. And as a thank you, I wanted to make this review something incredibly special. And to make this review special, I couldn't pick just some random TV movie or just another bad cartoon episode or another random movie. I wanted to do something not just big, but something that I've never done before. Something that would push the limits of what I've reviewed and give you guys a treat. Review 100 was drawn together the movie, and it made sense for that movie to be my 100th review. Not only was it the worst thing that I had seen up to that point, but it used many parodies of characters from many cartoons that I had reviewed. Not to mention that the problems and the themes that came from that movie were, let's say, familiar to me. For this review, for episode 150, I wanted to push the bar, but I didn't know exactly how I could do that. I mean, I've already reviewed my least favorite animations out there, the things that I've hated the most, the cartoons and the animated movies that I've hated the absolute most. I've even gone over some of my more controversial opinions. Pushing the bar is becoming a taller and taller order, but I think I found it. I don't know why it took me so long to figure this out, but today, we're tackling the worst thing the Cartoon Network has ever done. That's right, we're reviewing the 2006 Cartoon Network TV movie, Reanimated. All Jimmy Roberts ever wanted Robin, I, I, me, me, was uh, to be popular. That, that's cool. But now, uh, this boy needs an emergency brain transplant. Everybody wants him for his brain. I heard you got Mutapoli's brain. Yeah, that's awesome. Except it has a mind of its own. Hiya, Jimmy! It's the oddest, yeah. weirdest, freakiest original movie ever to hit the small screen. We're all in your head. Except Pickles, he's in your ear. Reanimated premieres Friday, December 8th on Cartoon Network. So, right off the bat, you'll notice that this movie has some really nice animation. I think that they're using some kind of uh, new rotoscoping technique because this almost looks like live action. <laughs> Wait, that doesn't make any sense. I thought that this was a Cartoon Network produced television movie. Wow, I actually made it more than a minute into this review without making that joke. But in all seriousness, that does lead us to a very important question for animated atrocities. And that's, does this count? Well, I mean, obviously yes, because I did decide to review it in the end, you could see the title. But let's talk technicalities here. I know that I bent the rules on both animated and atrocity in the titles of animated atrocities in my Cartoon Network as a whole review, and reviewing things like Wayside that weren't the worst thing in the world, but this is kind of on another level. It's a live-action animation hybrid, and unlike other live-action animation hybrids like Roger Rabbit, the animation in this movie doesn't really come in until about halfway through. It's very, very close to being considered a full live-action movie, but there are reasons that I do feel justified about talking about this movie specifically on animated atrocities and not making, like, a new series to talk about this specifically. First of all, there is animation in it, but there are other reasons. Most prominently, I do think that this is the biggest Jumping the Shark moment that the Cartoon Network has ever done. And Cartoon Network has the talent for getting me to bend the rules. Yes, I think that this movie is the absolute worst thing the Cartoon Network has done in all of its years of all of its decisions. And keep in mind that I I've been around for pretty much all of them. I've seen them canceling shows before their prime, annoying weird experiments, Johnny Test, obnoxious reboots, and I do think that this is the worst thing that they have done. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, Reanimated was the pilot movie for Cartoon Network's 
first live-action television show, Out of Jimmy's Head, which paved the way for Sanrio, which paved the way for Cartoon Network to have no idea what the fuck it was doing for half a decade. I mean, technically, some of those things aren't true, as Cartoon Network did have live-action here and there on their network before Out of Jimmy's Head. But it's thematically true, at least. Reanimated and by extension, Out of Jimmy's Head felt like the first in a long line of steps in Cartoon Network giving up on cartoons the first time. It appeared to be the first clear sign that something was going wrong with Cartoon Network. And it's actually weird to think about the decisions that Cartoon Network took after this movie. Because I was around when this movie came out. And I was in the target demographic when this movie came out. And it was not popular. Like, talk about some of the other most infamous things the Cartoon Network has done. Either they were like the Problem Solvers, which didn't last very long, when it proved to be unsuccessful, or they were like Teen Titans Go, which, no matter what you think about Teen Titans Go, it's hard to argue that it's not successful and it's not making Cartoon Network money, at least in the short term. But reanimated. Let me put this in perspective for you. Back before this aired, people were complaining that Cartoon Network was playing Osmosis Jones, because that movie had parts of live action. Oh, how times change. What a blissfully ignorant people we were back then. Even beyond that, Reanimated was critically panned, and Out of Jimmy's Head was hated even more. Not helping is that it decided to air during the mid-2000s writer's strike, which ended up killing a lot of shows. You know, the last time I was here at Fox Plaza, it was to see prototypes for a new line of Family Guy action figures. It was the first glimmer of what would become a huge line of merchandise, and I will tell you that I was almost as inspired as I am today. The sight of all you people gathered here in unity together to fight for your right to a fair contract tells me without a shadow of a doubt we are going to win this thing. Like, the only way that you could possibly consider this as the direction that you want to take your Cartoon Network is if you're trying to intentionally sabotage a success, or you have literally no idea what you're doing. Going the route of MTV when it was mocked and laughed and was largely irrelevant because it gave up on thinking that music was important. Then again, I'm not a business person. Maybe the executives at Cartoon Network saw something that we all didn't at the time. After all, with the end of Cartoon Cartoons and the advent of Flash, the network wasn't seeing the successes that it had from the past decade. Meanwhile, Disney Channel and Nickelodeon were blowing them out of the water with their live-action sitcoms. And sometimes, if you want to stay in the game, you've got to do something crazy and off the wall, even if it seems counterintuitive and, dare I say, utterly insane. I'm sure they knew how stupid this idea seemed on the face of it and went out of their way to make a strong case for why live-action was the wave of the future for a Cartoon Network. So how does live-action on Cartoon Network begin? That's a bright, beautiful future right there. So, our main character is Jimmy, and this is his father. Have you ever watched a cartoon sitcom, like, ever? Well, yeah, Jimmy's father is basically the father in that show. This is because Reanimated did actually do something correctly, at least in the planning phase. Reanimated was basically written to be a live-action cartoon. That's not a, a criticism, it seems to be an objective fact. And if it worked, it could have been a good transition from Animation Cartoon Network to CN Real Cartoon Network. Jimmy's father has animated dad syndrome. Jimmy's sister is a space alien, and Jimmy's mother is an astronaut, even though she's the more down-to-earth parent. Hurdy her her. The story is about a kid getting a brain transplant, and getting the cartoons of this world's Walt Disney stuck in his head. Walt Disney's no-talent son tries to decapitate him and steal his brain. There are many scenes and jokes that are just over-the-top quirky and weird. Several scenes have animals in the background for no real discernible reason. I can definitely see what they're going for. And that leads to the most interesting of all ironies with this movie. No, no really, I'm gonna blow your mind with this criticism. Almost all of this movie's problems stem from the fact that it is live action and it is not animated. And I don't just mean because it's a Cartoon Network movie. I mean, this movie would be a problem no matter where it aired. Animation and live action are two different mediums, and every medium has its advantages that the others don't. Books, for example, can go roughly as long as they'd like, and people generally wouldn't have a problem with that. Making something animated creates a discernible distance from reality that helps the audience accept more absurd premises, more violent actions, and strange concepts. For the sake of argument, let's pretend that the dumbass dad wasn't beaten to the ground even in 2006. In a cartoon, the cruel actions of Homer Simpson or Timmy Turner's father are more likely to be humorous because the cartoon characters are expected to be put through the ringer. Jimmy's father here, well... Whoop. Dad, can you please concentrate? I really need to 
get to school early today. No problem, kiddo. He makes me wonder why Jimmy isn't dead yet. I mean, it would if the editing in this movie wasn't fucking awful. Like, it's really, really obvious that they're just putting in car sound effects on top of the scene. The car doesn't stop and start and skid like the sound effects say it should, and it doesn't match at all. Not helping is the fact that they place a voiceover in when the characters who are talking in said voiceover are on screen and you can clearly see them not talking. This scene barely communicates the idea that the dad is a piss poor driver. And it goes back to my point. If this was animated, you could have the dad drive on the sidewalk through people's backyards, mowing down innocent bystanders. And when he says that he wants to run a few errands before school, you could stack stuff up on the car implausibly high because animation is better at exaggeration, usually shown through over-the-top expressions and body language, something that this movie decidedly does not have the advantage of. I want to get this out of the way right now because the acting in this movie is really really bad. And the child acting is even more so. The worst of it probably comes from Jimmy himself, who, uh, doesn't emote, like, throughout the entire movie. Y you know, Plank from Ed and Eddie, he seems to have more emotions than Jimmy here. And this makes the problems even more painful throughout the entire movie. The film uses a lot of slapstick humor, and being the main character, Jimmy is the target of a lot of it. In a cartoon, when this happens, the target can give these outstanding over-the-top expressions. It's what the medium is best at. However, when the target of slapstick humor barely reacts to it, it just doesn't work in any way, shape, or form. And I know that the actor was a child, and it's an extremely tall order to ask a child to do something like that. It's the reason why animation only rarely uses child actors, and instead uses adults acting as children. But to give him the benefit of the doubt, even assuming that they had the greatest actors in the world, I don't think this movie would have worked, because the script is absolute garbage. Half of Jimmy's lines are basically this. I, I, I mean, me, uh, I, I, I just want, want to, uh... This movie is the reason why I hate everything that I hate. There is so much love struck stuttering throughout this entire film. Also, there are moments like this. Pretend I'm Robin and ask me out. Uh, I think I'll pass. Come on, son, it's fine. Ask me out. This movie is disturbing. But wait, there's more. Oh, I know. <laughs> Hi, Jimmy. It's me, Robin. Ooh, I wish I had a big, strong man that I could go on the tilt world with. How about a kiss? That's our father! He's creepy and disgusting. One of the biggest problems of the movie is that Jimmy's, uh... The movie uses the term friend, but I'm not quite comfortable using that term. This character is Craig, and he is the worst. I thought that Milo was the worst, but, uh, no. Craig is such a bad, awfully written character, and, and such a mean-spirited person, that I can never hear the name Craig without going into an uncontrollable rage ever again. You better change the name of that! It's far too soon for Cartoon Network to ever have another Craig on the network. I might sound like I'm exaggerating, but wow, this character is just awful. I I'm getting ahead of myself. I mean, Craig doesn't start out too bad. The first thing that he does is act like a dumbass talking to the popular kids. Madison, Logan, Dakota, Dakota. Or should I say Mad Dog, Low Brown, the Double Ds? Oh, okay, uh, up top. Who are you? Uh, that's a good one, Logan. It's Craig. Oh, and, uh, oh, I love that game. I totally mastered the final level last weekend. Uh, this game just came out today. Psh, I know that. I uh, I had an advanced copy because it's like I know these guys that um stole it from corporate headquarters. They're um ninjas. What? So you guys want to hang out this weekend or? There are other ways to imply nervousness or awkwardness without having the characters blither and bumble on for all eternity, right? Then Craig shuts down Jimmy's concern, copies off of his homework without listening to what Jimmy has to say, and then gets excited that we're in with the cool kids when the cool kids borrow Jimmy's pencil and ignore Craig. They go to Craig's house after school. Eventually, after a long walk down this path, okay, once again, the editing in this movie is really shit. Even at the seven minute mark, it's already starting to take its toll on me. Scenes just drag on and shots go on for longer than they should. This establishing shot only needs to be on scene for like a second or two. And because every conversation is kind of, um, like, you know how it is when people kind of, um, stutter and, well, 
sputter and to talk forever and, and plither on and on about things since they kind of, well, they, they just kind of drag on a little bit. This movie, with the end credits, is about 84 minutes, and you can just tell that they were desperate to get to that mark. Uh, I thought you had dance class. I mean, not, not that I've memorized your schedule or anything. It got moved to Mondays. Oh, that, that's cool. I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't have a calendar t to note it. I mean, you can check my pants. This is every conversation for the first half of the movie. Well, except for the things that Robin says. Are you crazy? That's like every girl's dream. This is the most romantic Apple Day cartoon ever. I'm not an Apple Day freak or anything. I mean, every girl loves nights. Her dialogue is fascinatingly bad. Never mind not knowing how to write a child. Never mind not knowing how to write a girl. Try not knowing how to write a human being. You know, speaking of nights, um, the, the opposite of night is, is day, and, and t tomorrow's a, a day. And, um, and, you know, we're, we're going to Golly World tomorrow, and, and I was wondering if, um, if, if, you weren't ha if you didn't have anyone to... Every conversation. The next day, they go to Golly World, and this is probably what they blew the budget on. Renting out an amusement park for half a day can get kind of pricey. And you know how before in mundane locations, the shots would linger? Well, now that we're in a supposedly fantastical location, where things should be more exciting and we need things to sink in a bit more, the shots are rapid fire, and it barely lets you take anything in. Seriously, some of these shots only last for like half a second. Makes me wonder if they're trying to use like some subliminal mind control or some shit. Also, it's a running gag in this movie that all Belgians are really good at juggling. I, I, I don't know what the punchline is, but uh, if you want a five second review for this movie, weird for the sake of weird is not in and of itself funny. A world throwing random non sequiturs at me does not make me laugh. Then Craig does a thing. Hey, you know what would be awesome? If you held our step until we got off. Jimmy can do it. But dude, I want to ride the rides. Dude, don't blow this. What? Craig is an asshole, Jimmy's a pushover. Next scene, please. The kids go to the Hall of History, where we learn a little bit about the history of Milt Apple Day. Like... This program is brought to you by Tummy Yummy Paints. The only paints for licking. Well, now I know what inspired this movie, at least. But seriously, this joke is going to come back, and I'm going to say right up front that there are some things that genuinely tick me off about this movie. We'll get to that. The movie introduces the idea that Milt's brain has been frozen and hidden somewhere in the park. What? I heard it was hidden in a secret ice cavern in Texas Arctic Adventure Ride. And I heard little girls who spread lies get kicked out of Golly World and sent to the FBI. If this movie did anything good, it showcased how stupid and ridiculous myths like that were. Hiya, kids. I'm Milt Appleday. The greatest man who ever lived. You know what? I, I can't wait on this. I, I was going to save this for later when the joke came back, but no, we, we need to address this now because it's going to be distracting if I don't. You know that pink commercial? There's a joke down the road where Milt died from a lifetime of ingesting it. Here, here's the joke that comes up. Then, in 1977, tragedy struck. Milt died from a lifetime of licking tummy yummy paints. No, the producers of this movie weren't bitter at Disney at all. That's ridiculous. Where would you possibly get that idea? The man has a recording where he declares himself the greatest man who ever lived, and then dies because he ate paint all his life. I mean, I mean, it's just a homage. Why, why would you think otherwise? Which is why the Pickle and the Hedgehog characters exist. To reference Tom and Jerry, two classic Disney characters, you know, along with Transformers. They were uh, apparently the last thing that, that this Walt Disney did. Even though in this universe he died in 1977, and Transformers came out in the 80s. I mean, the character just treats his son like shit and calls him a booger as, as the only mention in his autobiography. It, it's a great homage. Make the ex of his characters act like utter assholes and make them irrelevant for the past 30 years. This homage kind of reminds me of the time the Family Guy directly went out of its way to insult the guy in Road to the Multiverse. Except that managed to be far less insulting somehow. But getting back on track, Craig does a thing. He does a lot of things in this movie. Hey guys, how totally sweet would it be if someone snuck into that ride and got Milt's brain? Jimmy will do it. What? No, I will right. No. Oh, dude, Jimmy, come on, just do it for us, man. You'll be a legend. Don't, don't worry. I heard from my cousin, who heard from his friend, who heard from his piano teacher, who heard from somebody, who heard exactly where it is. I, I could get kicked out of the park, and if Miss Salisbury found out, I could get expelled. All right. 
What? And I am sure we're going to get to know him quite well throughout the entire picture. They go on the ice roller coaster where Jimmy unscrews the protection bar. Fortunately for all of us, this coaster has several loops, so it'll be very unlikely for Greg to make it to the end of this unscathed, and we will all be happy for it. Nice green screen effects, by the way. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm being too nitpicky here. Because I've seen internet productions with absolutely no budget do scenes like this ten times better. This is only a professional network work. But seriously, y you think for something that's trying to make the case for Cartoon Network's future, the direction that they want to go in, you think that they'd put a little bit more budget into this. Down in the ice caves, Jimmy finds Sonny, the villain of the movie. You know that he's the villain because he wears a long dark cape and talks to his sack of money named Mittens. You know, this movie is kind of stupid. Speaking of stupid, we are about to see something legendary. I have been waiting for this one moment since I started planning this review. Ladies and gentlemen, please take a seat because the talk of this scene has been passed down from generation to generation. For some of you who first saw this when it came out, it might be fading from your memory, but I'm sure that it will all come flooding back to you when you see Jimmy get hit by the train. Like, I'm not even gonna make a joke here. This scene is enough of a joke in of itself. The funniest part is that it's not even over yet. Don't worry, son. The miniature hospital on Main Street is a real working hospital. And everyone who works here is a certified doctor. Zing. Like, what am I even supposed to say to any of this? Back in my day, all you needed was a high school degree to get a job. When that didn't make you special, people started getting college degrees. When that didn't work, people became doctors. And it still only got him a job working as a costume mascot at a dying amusement park. I actually, considering that that seems to be more and more plausible by the day, I, I, I am made myself sad. What do you got? This boy needs an emergency brain transplant. Well then, we have no choice. We have to give him milts. Okay. Uh, some random kid get, g gets hit in your park and you just give him Walt Disney's brain. Sure. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. You're asking me to buy quite a lot when I'm already shopping on a budget. Let's really talk about this. Reanimated has a ridiculous fucking premise. And you know, on its own, there's nothing wrong with having a ridiculous premise. Even live action shows can get away with strange and surreal premises. Like with Groundhog Day or The Truman Show. Those movies do have absurd premises. We even have a term for it, it's called a high concept film. But if you're going to do a movie with an absurd premise, you have to do it right. It may sound tempting that because you're using an odd or quirky premise that anything is on the table, and you can just go right off the rails right into insanity. But the opposite is actually true. When you're using a high concept, you've got to think of the implications and make things as plausible as possible in the world that you've created. You're obviously never going to be able to get it 100%. There's always going to be something that sneaks through the cracks. After all, there is a reason that these premises don't happen in our reality. But you've got to at least try. First of all, when you're picking an absurd premise, you only get one absurd premise. You can't use two or more. You only get one gimme. The first premise here is that brain transplants exist. And the second is that they're going to give the brain of one of the most creative people in the world in their universe to some kid who happened to get injured at the amusement park for no real reason. So just quickly going over a bullet point list of what's wrong here. So if brain transplants in this world exist, why aren't more people doing them? Why aren't more people talking about them? The ramifications of that alone could sustain a whole series of movies. Think about what you could do if you could switch brains with other people at will. Or, considering that personality glands are a thing, why wouldn't people bid over the brains of very successful, intelligent, or influential people? Notice that what I'm bringing up are creating more possibilities, not limiting possibilities. The best creativity actually comes from working within limitations, not the absence of limitations. The best stories come from structured creativity, not weirdness on top of weirdness. As for the other absurd premise, considering that Sonny is Milt Appleday's son, why not give the brain to him. This is actually a major plot hole in the movie. 
Yet, yeah, Sonny is the villain and all of that. He laughs evilly and whatever, but, but really think about it. Most of the evil shit he does is because he's trying to obtain said brain. He's the president of the company and has no talent of his own. This guy here. You know, the guy who takes off his whole costume in mid-sentence. We have to give him milts. But I thought that was an urban legend. No, oh, no, no, no. In fact, I was the surgeon that removed the brain from milk and kept it hidden all these years. Here's what he's actually doing by protecting Milt's brain in secret for 30 years. He's putting it somewhere where it can't be used. Well, the one person who could make use of it is running the company into the ground. He keeps the brain in the cooler for 30 years. Just because, I guess. Instead of actually actively looking for someone who might be a good heir to Milt Appleday's legacy. And after keeping it a secret and protecting it for 30 years, he gives it to some random child he knows literally nothing about that managed to get injured in an amusement park. Someone I highly doubt is the first person who has ever been injured in this amusement park. It's not that the premise is stupid. It's not that the premise doesn't make any sense in our logic. It's the fact that they didn't think through the premise at all. The previous examples I gave, Groundhog Day and The Truman Show, are some of my favorite movies of all time because they're high concept films that go out of their way to make their concepts as believable as possible in their own world. And of course, each of them have their own plot holes. Like I said, at some point you're going to hit the reason why this premise couldn't happen in our reality. Considering that Bill Murray's character has always been a jerk within the movie, why does the Groundhog Loop take effect right at that particular moment? And why would it have never happened to anyone else in his world? And how would essentially trapping Truman in his own little reality bubble be considered legal, especially after he becomes an adult? But you don't think about those in the movie because the movie goes out of the way to make it as plausible as they can in its own reality. If you want a more direct and more apt comparison, though, look to Roger Rabbit. The idea that live-action people in Toons inhabit the same world is a hard sell, but the movie goes very far out of its way to establish consistent and constant rules. They think through all of the implications that such a world would have. Toons are good at surviving deadly slapstick, so they'd need something special to do one in. Their dedication to consistency gets to the point where if Roger swallows live-action water, he spits out live-action water, and not animated water. And don't say that they can get away with this because this is a kid's movie, because kid's movies are probably the best at doing this high-concept things. It's almost a defining feature of that target demographic. Everything from Harry Potter to Matilda to Toy Story go out of their way to properly establish their concept and think through the consequences that their brand of magic would have on their world. For 30 years, I've gone without lunch. To keep this secret. Open it. Oh my god! Are those maggots? What the fuck is this? It looks like a piece of, uh, of chewed up taffy riddled with bullet holes. What what the hell is wrong with you? You, you kept this piece of a dead body in your lunchbox for 30 years and you brought it every day to work. What the fuck is wrong with you? No, no wonder you, you smelled bad every single day. How the fuck are you a doctor? For 30 years I've gone without lunch. To keep this secret. Open it. Open it. Gummy bears bouncing here and there and everywhere. So Jimmy wakes up and he's able to see the cartoon characters. And yay, we're at the part of the movie that really, really does piss me off. Oh yeah, th th this Walt Disney XP guy, he wasn't creative. He was just delusional. He didn't come up with things. He saw things, literally. Actually, that, in my opinion, is, is the worst part of the movie. Throughout the next segment of the film, the things in Jimmy's head start controlling his actions and telling him what to do. Like a mental illness. Like... A legitimately certified mental illness. It's a fairly easy joke to make that this movie is about schizophrenia. But beyond that, I hate. I mean, I absolutely hate pieces of media that conflate mental illness with creativity. I think that it sends the wrong idea on principle. Especially to kids. Yeah, delusions and hallucinations aren't scary. That's where the ideas come from. It may sound like I'm being a little bit petulant here, but creativity often does coincide with mental illness. The reason isn't understood yet, but a lot of creatives who have a mental illness create a cause and effect in their mind. 
It can lead people to refusing to get treatment because they believe that they'll lose that part of themselves. This is common with depression, and especially with drug addiction, where people believe that it's the drug that gives them their abilities. I don't find this funny or quirky. I think that the creators of this movie were so devoid of creativity that they didn't understand the concept of creativity, and were so lazy that they didn't think through their implications. To be fair, I guess, Reanimated isn't the only piece of fiction that has this problem, but still. But hey, it looks like there is some animation in this animated atrocity. Who knew? And this is some bad animation. Let's talk about it. The most consistent problem here is that none of the characters have a drop shadow. It may seem really small, like minuscule, but it's literally the most important thing in a live action animation hybrid. A drop shadow helps to distinguish where the characters are spatially and gives them a kind of grounding in reality. It makes it feel like they're really there, and without the shadows, it makes the characters seem like they're floating and all of the animation is poorly integrated. When Dolly cries here, the tears don't properly fit into the room because the animators didn't account for the furniture. They're small things, but they add up to ruining the defining feature of this movie. I mean, these are basic things, things that you need to understand if a live-action animation hybrid is something you're going for. And it really is movies like this that do make you appreciate Roger Rabbit and the effort that goes into that movie even more. As for the personalities of our cartoon characters, we have Itchy and Scratchy, or maybe I got that backwards. We've got the idiots, we've got the puns, and we've got Dolly, who doesn't have a personality trait, even. The only character that has a full-fledged personality is Golly, and he's, well, an asshole. Like everyone else in this movie. I know that the plot of the movie is all about Jimmy learning to assort himself or whatever, but it quickly gets obnoxious how Jimmy's just an average kid that no one understands, the voices in his head and even his best friend always giving him demands. So, Sonny begins his epic plan to steal Jimmy's brain by buying a for rent sign and claiming that his house has a room for rent. Now, hold on a second, honey. He did go through a lot of trouble to deceive us. I did. Maybe renting a room isn't such a bad idea. Kids could use a good father figure. That's our father! He's got me wondering why we're all not dead yet. I'm scared, please call the police. Also, uh... Sonny's acting isn't much better than all the other characters. Like, he starts evilly laughing towards the sky, but doesn't evil laughing require, I, I, I don't know, smiling maybe? Or at least making some kind of distinction from taking a shit. Also, Craig does a thing. I, I keep seeing cartoons, but like, not on TV, in real life. Whatever. What happened to you yesterday? You get hit by a train, then you like totally ditch me. Dude, I was in the hospital. It's always about you, isn't it? Is Craig's behavior supposed to be like some kind of joke? Because I'm gonna tell you right now that it's not funny. None the least. Here's the joke. This guy treats his friend like shit. It's not funny, it's not charming, it's not endearing. This character continually acts like an asshole throughout the entire movie and never given a single positive trait. There is nothing to like about him. Yes, yes, Jimmy needs to learn to stand up for himself. But at some point, you need to answer the question of why these two are friends. Like, it's at a point where, even if this was animated, this would be getting into the realms of very uncomfortable. And throughout the rest of the movie, all he's going to do is go ranting on about some kind of party. What the heck was that? Poor Jimmy. You should change your name to Matt. Because you're getting walked all over! So the voices in Jimmy's head agree to help him improve his life and not be such a pushover. I understand that I'm harping on about this, but I don't know, it just makes me uncomfortable. In terms about how all of this is portrayed as such a positive thing. Could you make this funny or quirky? Probably, but that requires talent, and you know, a actually giving a shit. None of the actors are good enough to have the appropriate reactions or expressions, and all that you're left with without them is the implications that these concepts send. Not helping us that the attempts at comedy are very poorly timed and the actual animation is very poorly animated. You see, when doing a live-action animation hybrid, you need to go out of your way to make it look like you're doing something more than just drawing pictures over the camera lens. Like, with this mop here, how it moves as it swung doesn't match any sort of reality and it just looks awfully animated. I get that live action animation hybrids are really expensive and you need to put in a lot of money to make them work. Which, which makes it a very, very weird decision for Cartoon Network to go this route when they were having financial difficulties. Jimmy! Hey! We've been looking all over for you. Really? Why? I, I, I mean, you look really pretty today. You really laid that eyeshadow on th thick. I, I mean, not that you look cheaper. Anything. Also, this is still going on. Don't. 
Anyway, I heard you got Multabaldi's brain. Um, yeah. Because that's a realistic line that someone would say. It's amazing how Robin is the least human acting character in this movie. When we've got an actual alien to compare her to! Speaking of which, Yancey the alien is more or less pointless to the story. It wouldn't be hard to write her out completely. And the only reason that Jimmy has an alien sister is because cartoons be quirky, right? But at the same time, the scenes with her are the best in the entire movie. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe you couldn't hear me knocking over your insane ranting! Oh, I mean, if you want to steal his brain, just steal it. You don't have to announce everything. Like when I use the bathroom, I'm not like, and now I shall use the great and powerful bathroom! No. I just go. And I use the fan. Hint! I'm not kidding. She is quite clearly the best actor in the entire movie and is putting way too much effort into trying to salvage this thing. As for her character, she acts like a typical teenage girl would, needing to deal with the absolute insanity that is the rest of the movie. And it works comedically. This movie tries to pay homage to cartoons, as it's trying to be written like a cartoon would. Like, the scenes where Yancey goes into Sunny's room to just rant at him. They are some of my favorite scenes in the entire movie, and possibly the movie's only redeeming features. I except uh, that, that beloved train effect. This movie tries to pay homage to cartoons, as it's trying to be written like a cartoon would be written. But it's clear that the people making this movie don't care or have any interest in cartoons, so they're homaging and parodying it without knowing how the tropes work. If you're not into cartoons, it's easy to get the impression that all cartoons are all over the top weird and quirky. But if you are into cartoons, really think about how many are actually like that. Cartoons very often employ the use of a straight man. In something even as surreal as Spongebob, you've got Squidward, for instance. In something as insane as Ren and Stimpy, Ren usually does play a lot closer to reality, at least until you piss him off, and the comedy works a lot better for it. Here, I, I guess Jimmy is supposed to be the straight man to the insanity of this world, but he never has a reaction to anything. He goes along with everything everybody says without so much as an expression. So, Jimmy remembers who Sonny is and then runs off from the dinner table. Sonny tries to chase him, but he's told that he needs to finish what's on his plate, because... Ha ha. He eats his food and is built up how these two characters are going to interact for the first time. But then the scene ends and it's the next day. Or maybe it's later that day. I don't fucking know because they didn't establish anything. Yeah, I, I guess the villain trying to steal Jimmy's brain following up into his room just isn't important. Instead, we gotta give more screen time to Craig doing a thing. Oh, by the way, Craig does a thing. You know how I told you I keep seeing cartoons in the real world? You know, Golly and Dolly and all those guys? No, you never tell me anything. I thought I was your best friend. Dude, I totally told... Ugh. Okay, whatever, man. But now this Sunny guy moved into our house. What? So now Sunny's your best friend. Is he throwing a party too? Are you even listening? What was the purpose of this character? Because, I'll tell you, the only thing that it's succeeding in doing is pissing me off. However, Robin does seem to care about what Jimmy has to say. And Jimmy has a lot to say. Together, that's... That's, that's, that's totally cool. I mean, you know, cool as beans, cool as ice, cool beans, um, you know, black beans, or, uh, the fried beans are good, but, um, there's also, I think there's jalapeno beans, have you ever had those before? But, uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's brown beans, black... We're getting quite close to the halfway mark of this movie. Like, most movies that go this route and have the love-stricken idiot stutter and sputter have the mercy to have it only happen once or twice and leave it after, like, ten minutes. But no, this just goes on and on. And if you want to know why I hate this show so much, this movie is a great case study into why it can piss me off so much. The random lines that Jimmy says aren't funny. But the biggest problem with Love Struck Stuttering is that the words that are spoken are always empty. They don't convey any information that we don't know. Which is the point of dialogue in film. I mean, they convey that Senor Stupid has an awkward crush, and the writers don't know how to write a childhood crush. But at the 30 minute mark, it's like, I get it already! Move on! So Robin shows Jimmy a room, and I'll be honest, this is one of those scenes that is a microcosm of everything wrong with the entire film. Like, everything. Oh. Whoa.
Even I'm not into us this much. What are you even talking about? Have you seen the room of, like, any seven-year-old that's into that one specific thing? Transformers, ponies, princesses? Like, with you here, it's just sheets, posters, and toys. Maybe it's just being a citizen of the internet for ten years, but I have seen people with much, much more merchandise of a particular product in their room. Going back to the original problem, if, if this was animated, you could really pack the room with more and more stuff. Things that would be unreasonable to fill any given real-world room. Like, I don't know, a fairground ride. Now, out of nowhere, Jimmy is suddenly able to talk to his crush. Who are you talking to? God, just golly, he's just... Wait, the cartoons are here right now? Hello, cartoon friends! I'm your number one fan! They... Say hey! Hi! The acting and the expressions and the inflections aren't strong enough to bring this joke to life. Even if they could, it would probably be cliché. Milt Appleday often referred to Sonny as his least favorite son, though he was an only child. In fact, the only mention of Sonny in Milt's autobiography was, quote, That little booger creeps me out. This! This right here! This image is perfect. It's the perfect way to show everything wrong with this movie. First of all, Golly had no indication that he also had a crush on Robin, or even a crush on her for crushing on him. But more to the point, imagine the scene without the cartoon character around. It's fucking creepy! Just having Jimmy stare at Robin with that expression for God knows how long. Because the movie is in live action, you get this constantly. What would be funny in animation is just disturbing in live action sometimes. There's a reason the bowler hat guy from Meet the Robins is funny, and Sonny isn't even though they frequently do the exact same things. And also, you've got a good point in comparison to how cartoons emote versus how people emote right here. If anything, this movie is a good crash course on understanding the advantages of cartoon characters versus live action ones, how they express, how they communicate, and so on. Golly Gopher went from being the most famous cartoon in the world to a nobody. What? What does she mean I'm a nobody? How could people not like me? Well, cause Sonny made these. Said the guy who is talking to Robin because he lacks knowledge on Apple Day and didn't even know who Sonny really was until earlier in that evening. We only get to see, like, a screenshot of what Sonny made, and the joke, if you could call it that, is hardly able to sink in. Check it, check it, check it, dog. <laughs> They ruined me! I was perfect and they ruined me! How could something so beautiful be made so ugly? <laughs> the earring's nice. Speaking of which, this whole scene creates a plot hole. Throughout the entire movie, up until this point, Apple Day has been put on some kind of pedestal. The amusement park is still active and a lot of people are happy to go. No one claimed that they didn't like it. But if we're talking about a cartoon studio that's been out of date and out of popular for like 30 years, don't you think that someone would have commented on it? Like, maybe at the middle school? You'd think that if this is what Golly was known for now, you'd think that some of them would be a little bit more apprehensive to go to Golly World. This movie was clearly written in one draft, via a game of Round Robin. People just threw ideas in the fire as quickly as they could and didn't say no to a single one because they thought animation was going out the door and kids were stupid and would buy anything. It doesn't make sense. What would the president of Apple Day want with you? I... I am... I... Uh, okay. Let's think about this. Just a little bit. Jimmy vs. Uh, Sonny, when he was clearly talking about looking for Milt's brain. In the place he was told Milt's brain would be. You're talking to Jimmy right now because he has Milt's brain. Sonny shows up at Jimmy's house shortly after Jimmy gets Milt's brain. The cartoon studio that Sonny is the president of is failing without Milt's brain. Please tell me that, that one of you two can make the connection. This, this isn't even a joke. Like, in the movie, it's not even a joke. It, it's written like they're expecting the audience to have not put these pieces together yet. I... I, I need to take a break. I'm, I'm making this a two-parter. I need to break something right now. Th that moment is just... This movie should not be finished in one sitting.